So, good morning, everyone. We are a bit late, so I think we should start the panel. Um, and I'm very pleased to host this panel to share with you some of the, the thoughts we should all together uh, start making, or we have already started making, in terms of organizing the European scientific um, information space, as we say it, which has a challenge, which has a, also a global challenge um, in front of us, uh, which is linking publication and data. So this is the topic, the main topic of this um, panel. But I think you will hear a lot of things that uh, are related with this because it's a very compli complicated, complex uh, domain. It leads a lot of work from policy, legal, uh, infrastructure aspects to approach it. So I'm very pleased to, to be here with Carl um, Christian Boer, member of the cabinet of Vice President Nili Cruz, responsible for the digital agenda in the European Commission. Professor Jan Reinhardt, director of the Max Planck Institute for um, Biophysical Chemistry and member of the DFG Senate. Dr. Frederick Friend, honorary, honorary director of the scholarly communication at UCL and an advisor of the Commission on things related with um, uh, open access infrastructures. Uh, my colleague Daniel Spichtinger, uh, working at the Research Director General um, in the same topics of um, open access to scientific information. Uh, we have been working quite uh, a lot together on this, on this subject. Um, Professor Yanis Ioannidis from University of Athens, coordinator of Open Air, that you know well from, from yesterday's presentations. Professor Norbert Lossau hosting us here today. Um, director of the Göttingen University and uh, recently nominated Vice President of the Göttingen University. And Professor Enrique Alonso Garcia from the Consejo de Estado of the Spanish Government. He will join us now. So uh, I think we, we should not wait uh, long for the first introduction that we have planned by Carl Christian Burr. Uh, and uh, I, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce him today, this morning, uh, because as you know, the European Commission is an institute, institution with multiple roles, uh, policy maker, legislator, funder, and so on. You know this. And our methods, uh, methods of work are relatively uh, complex, so there is a lot of energy and time uh, put uh, in, in, uh, in preparing the policies, uh, preparing impact assessments, uh, communications, recommendations. And I and Danielle are witness of the really key role that Carl plays in uh, shortening distances between different services in the Commission. Uh, and helping uh, really uh, reaching the, the agreement not only within the Commission uh, as such, the different services, but also uh, in the European context with other institutions at European level and uh, in the Member States. So we have witnessed really uh, this important role of facilitating our uh, collective um, efforts in the Commission. So. Uh, we have asked Carl uh, to, to share a little bit uh, his uh, thoughts about these uh, new challenges of uh, uh, the data infrastructure and the data policies. As you know, we have uh, uh, adopted, the Commission has adopted the, the recommendation and communication package uh, recently. So I will not say much more except to invite Carl to take the floor. So, thanks, Carlos, for the very kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here this morning, even though I apparently ate something wrong yesterday and therefore don't feel very well. So I, please excuse the one or other slur in my, in my talking. It may happen. Last time in Germany, when I spoke about this topic, I was supposed to speak in German, which was much more difficult for me, given this international uh, debate and the vocabulary. So now I'm trying to uh, give you a little bit of an overview of how these things fit together as a European matter of public policy. Um, sitting where I'm sitting, that is an important element to bring up 
when bringing other people in to this, uh, to this policy and explaining why this is something that Europe should be concerned about, why this is something that uh, Brussels should be concerned about, and how we make it happen. Um, it's not yet there, this presentation. It will be there probably tomorrow. My hotel uh, broadband was so slow that it didn't work out. Uh, you can have fun with this presentation afterwards if you like. Uh, I put it under Creative Commons license. Uh, that's me. Why am I talking uh, here? First of all, um, to give you the context, Europe, when we say open access in Europe, what does it mean? Uh, we have Europe in, in the terms of Brussels, the European institutions that work together, the Parliament and the Council. We also have the member states as member states. We made a recommendation to what they should do in our view. This is not obligatory, but it's the aim is to bring everybody around to the table to discuss and maybe agree on, on common ways of doing things. So this is really the aim. All of these institutions uh, are involved and of course right now uh, legislative debates are still ongoing uh, in the Parliament and the Council also covering or uh, addressing open access. Now, uh, I'm, of course, coming from the European Commission, but I'm still speaking in a personal capacity. I need to stress that um, because, obviously, I cannot speak for the College of Commissioners, which is this stern uh, body. Uh, you saw Ms. Uh, Gagan Quinn speaking yesterday. Uh, she's the Science Commissioner. Uh, this file is treated by us, as Carlos already mentioned, as a joint effort between the science Directorate and the Connect Directorate, which is, if you would want to put it in one word, concerned with ICT. And of course, we are talking mainly infrastructures here. Open air is, is an infrastructure. That's why both sides are involved. And Ms. Gagan Quinn has, for example, here Mr. Schwichtinger working for her and some other good people with, which, with whom we have really good uh, cooperation on this file. I'm working for Nelly Cruz, who is uh, the Vice President for the Digital Agenda, and I'm advising her on a number of topics, uh, including this one. Um, why is Neely involved? Well, we, she is responsible for the digital gender policy program for Europe in the area of ICT and telecom regulation networks, uh, all of the elements uh, concerned with ICT. What is the digital gender? It's a policy program, 100 actions, designed to remove barriers, unnecessary barriers that prevent the advantages of the digital development from accruing to all of us in our various roles as, as citizens, as students, as patients, as teachers and as researchers, none the least. Um, one of the elements, one pillar of the strategy concerns the question of R&D. DG Connect is responsible for the implementation of ICT research at the European level in FP7. Uh, this will continue in Horizon 2020, the next framework program. That's why this is an important pillar of our policy. Insufficient R&D, what do we do about this? Well, we try to find some more money, but we also try to make things more effective more efficient in cooperating, doing more with less or at least with the same kind of amounts. The fifth pillar of the digital agenda, research innovation, the main target is to keep the growth of investment in this field going beyond 2014. You may know that the European budget is right now debated in Brussels as we speak. Uh, the heads of state and government are in Brussels right now discussing uh, these things. Uh, and Vice President Cruz and all our teams are of course very active in, in arguing that this is an area in which we should invest precisely because we are in a, in a uh, crisis today, because we need to care about the future as well. It's, it doesn't help you if you save money and thereby, killing, uh, thereby kill uh, your future opportunities. And the main actions uh, in this pillar are uh, the, the increase of the money, as I mentioned, and the pooling of the resources. That's an important point. I'll give you one example. Our commissioner spoke in Munich yesterday to the nano electronics industry, so the chip makers, and in that field, Europe the public in Europe is paying, investing a lot of money, not less than some other parts of the world that are often described as being far ahead and Europe is being described as, as having lost. The problem in Europe is that in many cases the member states' actions are not coordinated. So you have this pile of money, but then you fragment uh, the use of it. Member states only are only concerned about the companies that are in their territory, not really thinking about Europe as a whole, being able to have to having uh, all the value chain in that industry that is necessary. And our commission is very much committed to, to changing that, to addressing this problem, because that's what Europe is about. And maybe she doesn't succeed, but this is what the whole logic uh, of the common market means in the digital uh, area. Now, we're all waiting for the budget. I mentioned it. Um, just to give you an amount of the size, uh, one trillion euros are requested, proposed, and um, the debate is going on right now. There are different parts of the debate, some say we need or we will have a compromise this week, others are more pessimistic, 
we will see. It is clear that many member states are pushing for a lower amount here, and the whole discussion is then about where to cut. You know that uh, roughly a third of this money is foreseen for uh, agriculture um, support, subventions in the field of, of agriculture. This has been the case for a long time. The amounts are shrinking, but it's still almost 30% today of the EU budget, and one can have a debate, and we think we should have a debate if there are cuts, where should we cut and where shouldn't we cut. Horizon 2020, I mentioned it, the next framework program for research, 80 billion euros proposed. Right now, Hermann van Rompuy, the president of the European Council, has proposed around 75 billion. Uh, overall, he proposed a number of cuts, so we will see how this plays out. Obviously, the Commission will want to have invest 80 billion in this field. Three parts of Horizon 2020, most important probably from an infrastructure perspective for you uh, is the excellence pillar in which uh, we have foreseen 4 billion euros for ICT, which covers both the e-infrastructures budgets, which I think are at the basis of some of the projects that you are involved in, including open air, um, and uh, some other areas. Obviously, there's also a strong link of the open access policy to this aim of addressing societal challenges and to really investing the money where it has the most impact, because that's, that's the whole rationale of uh, doing open access to speed up these things. July 2012, we adopted a communication and recommendation. Communication is a policy document in which the Commission sets out its thinking about a certain topic. In this case, it set out its thinking about how it will implement open access under Horizon 2020. So for all the research, publications, and data stem stemming from uh, the 80 billion or a bit less, we will see, uh, that are going to be invested. Um, plus a recommendation to member states, which is very much in line with the, rec uh, with the communication. So basically saying, well, we are, we are going to do this, and we think you should also be going to do uh, the same thing. The goals, the high-level goals are threefold. We want all member states to have uh, open access policies in place, real policies in place by 2014. Uh, by 2016, uh, we want 60% of all research, publicly research, publicly funded research publications in Europe to be available in open access. I had lots of debates about this number already. Uh, I could tell you, some people say, well, you, you will never get there. Others are saying, why are you so timid <laughs> with this goal? Uh, maybe we have hit a little bit the middle there, because today, you know, the, the figure most cited is around 20%. Uh, 2016 is just four years off, so it will not be, not be an easy goal uh, until then. Uh, so we, therefore, we think it's an, it's an ambitious target, in fact, uh, to reach, because it presupposes that the member states are indeed putting open access policies in place, and not only politically, but also institutions. In many member states, including Germany, you have very various levels of, of independence uh, of decision-making uh, uh, ranges for institutions themselves that can decide, and all of that, of course, in the end needs to come together to reach uh, such a target. And obviously, for Horizon 2020, for its seven-year period, we are aiming at having 100% open access to publications. Uh, you will have discussed this yesterday, and I, I know that my my colleague was here yesterday, also the commissioner gave a video message. I don't need to go into the details, just the high-level uh, elements that everybody's always looking at when talking about this. Obviously, there's much more in this communication, the recommendation. For example, the topic of preservation, also the infrastructure topic is covered. What we have planned um, for Horizon 2020 is to accept both green and gold uh, open access uh, for the researchers to comply with the open access mandate that we are uh, working to put into Horizon 2020. That means for us, uh, it is fine if researchers do self-deposit. We accept in that, uh, for that case, embargo periods from six months and 12 months for human humanities and social sciences, uh, in line with various others, other bodies that have the same uh, embargo periods uh, put forward in their policies. Uh, and we are also providing re reimbursement of uh, author of publication charges uh, for uh, gold open access publishing as eligible costs in the projects and we are working moreover <coughs> on a way to make sure that in the future if your research and your project is over you can still tap into some of the support uh, even after the last payment to, to a project has been made. Uh, this is today a problem because there's no, there's no hook for you to come and ask for the money. We are having very intense discussion with our lawyers. <laughs> to make this possible, and I'm very confident that we will do it. At. And on data, I'm sure this has been discussed a few times, we are putting forward a pilot in our addiction, 
every time I'm asked to explain this, a pilot means everything where it makes sense. This is not like the open access pilot today. This is not about 5% of the budget or 10%. This is about the real thing without a hard obligation because we know that in, uh, when it comes to data in several areas, you have also varying uh, concerns when it comes to the different subjects. Uh, we believe that we are not yet there uh, to have um, something mandatory, but we are working to make it practical. Even today, we have sometimes projects where the people come and say, I, I want to do open access to data, but I'm in this consortium, it's not foreseen, it's, can you help me, can, uh, can we get the coordinator to, to do something about it? Very complicated. In the future, uh, even in the pilot, if you get these things into the consor uh, consortium agreement, in the grant agreements, it will be much easier to actually do it uh, if you anyway want to do it as a project. So we have the policy in place. Uh, we need to implement it. That's clear. We're working on that. There will be uh, there's an internal action plan to put in place all the elements of the communication. Uh, my colleagues in, in, in both DGs are very much uh, in, uh, in cooperation in uh, setting this out and making it happen. And one important element, of course, going forward is the infrastructure supporting all this. In particular, for me, this is the main concern about data, because if we start doing a, a pilot for data, you cannot simply leave people out there on their own and, and say, well, now it's in, your, in our contract and you make sure that you put it in the right place. Not the least because we don't want them to go into different directions and in the end maybe we lose again this kind of data that is being deposited there. Similar to open air, I believe that we will have to provide a default setting, something that you can fall back to if there's no other evident way where you could put uh, your data. And of course there are some, uh, depending on the, on the subjects, where you have su subject specific repositories for data and other infrastructures that have already been uh, created. That is of course fine. We don't want to reinvent the wheel here. This is about the logic of linking up such <laughs> infrastructures. Um, I don't need to explain that one here. Uh, we are involved, uh, informed by uh, various uh, expert input that we have received over the last few years, uh, notably these two reports that I suggest everybody to read who, who hasn't yet done so. You will see many of the elements that inform our work now to setting out a roadmap for the infrastructure uh, investments in the next few years. So we are planning what to do, what to call for in terms of projects in 2014, 15 and subsequently to get closer to this overall aim of making the data, the infrastructure, making it uh, transparent linked up in interoperable and also sustainable infrastructure. Uh, the digital European research area is an important element in that as well. On the same day as the communication recommendation, we, the Commission has adopted a uh, communication on the ERA, as it's called. Uh, we have been very much involved in that as well, again with the colleagues of, of DG Research, um, to make sure that the infrastructure aspects are covered there as well. We have this tag, digital ERA, for that, and uh, this is also part of the um, roadmap that is right now being worked on. Once this is online, you will have a number of pointers here because our commissioner, uh, for those, many of you will know that already, but she has been very active in the last few years, starting, I think, really with the main open air event in Ghent in December, almost exactly two years ago. Um, she has been very outspoken on this topic on a number of occasions. I put some links here. You find the others by, by following uh, then uh, through those documents just to see uh, that this is really a high-level policy priority for Commissioner Cruz. Uh, it is also one for Commissioner Gegenkuhn, as you have heard yesterday. So the Commission is really aligned uh, behind this goal and is pushing uh, to, to make it happen. And with that, I would leave uh, the introduction and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Carl, for this uh, setting the scene. Uh, it puts us in the right uh, stage to go for a round table uh, and address some issues, but you notice that there was a slide from Carl saying that now it's the infrastructure, stupid, so, but I will not take it personally. Um, so, but what I would uh, really like the, the panel to trigger a discussion and involve the audience at a certain point is to, to have a, a little bit what they think the, these challenges we have ahead concerning the opportunities and barriers for this uh, scientific data space in Europe that is open and the pro-science attitude in that, how they see the role of individual researchers and their organizations, the role of infrastructures, of course, and also the stakeholders, including publishers, libraries, uh, service providers, technology developers, and so on. So 
a bit covering all these and let's try to have a, a sort of a collective brainstorm and uh, start this uh, um, learning process for the coming years. So I would invite uh, Dr. Uh, Frederick Friend to start with this um, a short statement uh, and then I will go around the table and then we'll open to, to the audience for, for you to, to come into the discussion. So Fred. Thank you. I picked up on the uh, subtitle of this session, Making the Vision a Reality. <coughs> because for more than 10 years, open access to publicly funded research publications and data, that's been a vision. Now we have the opportunity to make the vision a reality. In the uh, policies for Horizon 2020, we have the political framework within which research institutions, authors, repository managers, and publishers can work to realize the vision. We can no longer hide behind the lack of political impetus for open access. We can no longer hide behind the lack of an operational infrastructure for open access. In every aspect of this open access infrastructure, there are still areas to be developed, particularly in the area of scientific data, which we've not really tackled. But the essential political and operational infrastructure is in place, and there is the political will to make it work and to produce the benefits we all look for. So what more needs to be done by those of us who attend this conference and by the organizations we represent? Much of what I suggest may appear boring administration, but it is at this detailed level that the success or failure of the policies will now be determined. Firstly, from the Commission, we need clear and firm guidelines for researchers funded under Horizon 2020 about what they need to do in order to fulfill their open access obligation. The guidelines should require every researcher to deposit a version of their article and its associated data in a repository from which it can be harvested as soon as the article is ready for publication. If the publisher requires a short embargo, the article need not be released for public access until the embargo period has expired. But this should not delay the deposit in a repository. We have already lost too many open access articles through author's delay in making deposits. <coughs> Secondly, we need all open access repositories to be open air compliant so that the content can be harvested and reused. The number of compliant repositories is still too low. And while the open air team have helped by introducing plugins for different systems, more direct help needs to be provided for those repositories facing an additional workload to become open air compliant. The solution has to be a partnership between local repositories and the open air team. Thirdly, we need an easy to administer mechanism for those authors who choose to publish in open access journals. We need to make provision for authors wishing to publish in open access journals which do not charge an author publication charge. And also we need to make provision for an easy payment mechanism for authors wishing to publish in those journals requiring the payment of an APC. As with repository deposit, so with the funding of author publication charges, uncertainty and the lack of clear guidelines have deterred authors from taking those options, which will be additional to a deposit in an open access repository. If we can make all of this happen, and there is no reason why we should not, the vision will become an everyday reality. Now the open access vision is only the first vision. A second vision, which we have yet to address, is the vision of the effect of universal open access upon human society. This second vision, second vision 
did appear in the Budapest Open Access Initiative. But to date, we have been so busy achieving widespread open access that we have not even developed the objectives for a vision to achieve the benefits from open access. In my mind, it is a vision which enables humankind to conserve this planet's natural resources upon which our life depends, and also to level some of the inequalities in access to those resources. Every morning, I walk with my dog through the woods and fields conserved 130 years ago by Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli and his wife. Their conservation of natural resources sat alongside a commitment to the Industrial Revolution. We know about their managed conservation of woods and fields through the books and manuscripts they have left behind. In the ones and the zeros of the electronic databases compiled by today's researchers, there will be the seeds of policies for the conservation and sharing of the natural resources of the future. Maybe this will be thought of as a political vision, but the vision is rooted in the contribution the research undertaken in our universities can make to the well-being of humankind through open access and beyond open access. Those are my thoughts for us to discuss. Thank you, Thank you Fred. This mm. was very inspiring. Um, and uh, for uh, logistical reasons, I would ask my colleague Daniel to also share with us a few of his thoughts because he may have to leave uh, a bit early for the train. So, Daniel, um, the floor is yours. Uh, so, thanks very much, uh, Carlos, and uh, for having me here on this panel, and also, of course, to the organizers. Um, maybe a few remarks complementary to what we heard before um, from Carl, but also yesterday. Uh, from the side of, of DG research, I think this is um, open access, is, as we heard also um, in the opening speech of the commissioner, a very important aspect of Horizon 2020, but also going beyond that of um, something else that Carl mentioned, the European research area, so abbreviation um, ERA, which basically is, in a nutshell, a single market for researchers uh, addressing various aspects, researcher mobility, but also addressing the circulation of knowledge in Europe. And uh, we published on the 17th of July the new era communication, where under the heading circulation of, your, um, of knowledge, you have things like knowledge transfer, digital era, but also open access. So what means the era basically is, um, of course, including our own funding program, Horizon 2020, but moving beyond that and inter interacting with the member states and also interacting with the stakeholder organizations, um, five of which have signed a memorandum of understanding on um, July 17th, uh, actually four and one statement, where they also commit themselves to promoting open access in their membership. So that's basically a complementary uh, policy toward, to the digital agenda. Um, where are we now? Basically, uh, this was something that was mentioned in, in your presentation yesterday in passing, but I find it's, it's, it's really quite an encouraging sign that already in FP7, where we had a pilot on open access to publications, we see that 40% of um, FP7 publications are in open access mode. And I consider this uh, really encouraging also, um, given the target figures that uh, you, Carl, presented, I think from the side of the Commission, if um, in Horizon 2020 we have open access as the default option, um, open access to publications, we should be able to reach these targets of 60% uh, 60, 60 in 2016 and, um, well, maybe not 100%, but 99.9% .9 in <laughs> this. You will never have 100% compliance uh, in 2020. So I think this 
is, you know, this is for me the vision, but it's a vision that's, uh, I would say, quite realistic um, with two caveats. Firstly, we know that uh, the legislative process for Horizon 2020 isn't finished yet. So it will depend in the end uh, what sort of text uh, the Council and the Parliament will agree on. You have seen our proposals, so our proposals are really um, to have open access to publications as the default option and to experiment with open access to data in form of a pilot. So this is, I would say, the first challenge. This is a very near-term challenge to actually have this in the final text. Um, then I might say maybe a challenge for the intermediate future is uh, in the implementation. This may be also a little bit for, for open air because if you have then this provision about full open access, I think it will mean more work for open air also because you will simply have more publications, more questions also from researchers. Which brings me to a second challenge. I think all of us in, in the room are aware of what open access is and how it works. Um, I'm not quite sure that in the wider scientific community we have achieved this level of understanding. So people hear open access and they have a sort of idea and it's not always the, the, the idea that we have and our understanding of open access. So keeping up the, the good work that open air does and then complementing it with further initiatives for awareness raising is I think something that's very needed. And I might just uh, remind you, for those of you who don't know, uh, that um, in the next call for proposals, uh, in, Hawaii, in, in uh, the last one for FP7, in the Science and Society Work Program, we will be funding two coordination and support actions, one in helping the member states to uh, network and coordinate their open access activities, and the second one to train and do awareness raising with the scientific community, with the funders. So these calls are open. Um, the deadline is, is in January. Uh, just uh, a short promotion here in case uh, this is someone who wants to apply. So you can find all information on the, on the participant portal. Um, with that, I think I have, I have uh, outlined uh, some complementary aspects to uh, what has already been said. I have to leave around 12.30, 12, uh, 12.45, but until then, I'm, I'm also happy to take uh, questions after the presentations. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel, for this uh, complementary information. Actually, quite important because the recommendation will require this coordination with the member states. So it's, it's important for you to know this. Um, so uh, I would like now to invite Professor Heinard um, with uh, his experience as uh, managing a, a research institute, but also as uh, an advisor to some of the uh, very new initiatives in, in, in publishing, uh, in new ways of publishing. So Professor Heinard, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, First of all, I would like to inform you that I'm standing in for the president of the German Research Foundation, the DFG, who sent his greetings to the meeting but couldn't attend. And I would like to uh, emphasize that the DFG is a, the major funding organization for uh, competitive funding in Germany, is fully behind the open access movement. They have uh, actually signed the so-called Berlin Declaration, and they have actually various funding schemes under which they invite projects supporting, you know, not only open access in publication, but also uh, data management, um, uh, new strategies in data management, data storage, uh, data availability, and uh, there's actually a new call which we will actually be deciding upon in, in a week from now whether this is going to be launched and it looks all pretty positive. So in that sense, there's full support from our German uh, major funding organization. Now having said this, I should also say that I'm sitting here as an active scientist and um, to give you um, perhaps a flavor of the fact that things are not so simple as I sometimes sound when I'm listening to all these presentations here, is that by myself, even though I'm really favoring the major um, goal of open access, making scientific information publicly available as soon as possible, uh, the last 50 publications my group has published, uh, only one was published in a true open access journal. 
which is means open access in a point that it is open, accessible for everyone on day one after publication. All the other ones were based on were published in subscription-based journals, which do have obviously embargo periods, and we, we try to comply with you know repositories as much as we can. But after all, you see that in my field, biomedicine, we still are dominated by traditional journals. Now. Uh, let me emphasize that uh, it's always nice, as I heard this morning, to do some publisher bashing, you know, from uh, Elsevier in particular is, is an easy elephant to beat, you know. But um, there is another group of journals which in my field is quite prominent and which I'm, I have the feeling is almost forgotten by the open access movement. And these are journals edited by non-profit scientific organizations. Mm. Yeah. In my field, these journals are actually the dominant, the leading ones, the high-quality journals, which are edited by, for instance, you know, societies. And I'm speaking here in particular for the European Molecular Biology Organization that is editing four high-profile journals. Now, these journals are subscription-based, and we are struggling in EMBO to really see how we can make the transit to open access financially viable. Now, two of the four journals are open access, and they obviously lose money, and they lose money because the editing process of a selective journal, that is selective means that they have a high rejection quality, they are really very quality oriented, are so high that the author processing charges, no one would pay them to even cover the cost. I mean, the one open access journal in molecular systems biology, which has an impact factor of something like 12, 13, 14 by now, they barely break even. Uh, they have an author processing charge of four, about 4,000 euro. If the other journals, if they would be conf converted to open access, the author processing charges would need to be even higher. So this is problem number one. Problem number two is that obviously these societies make money on these subscription-based journals, but this money is being invested directly back into the purpose, and this is supporting science. For instance, at EMBO, they support the EMBO Young Investigator Program. It is a program which is you know, very important for the European scientific community. Now, this income would be lost if one converts to open access just to you know, make men's ends even. And obviously, there may be solutions for these problems. So there may be other alternative funding sources. But the general, uh, let's say, point I would like to make in this context is if one refunnels funding sources, for instance, to directly, again, fund these activities of these societies by governmental funds or, or the pub public funds in one way or another, that would make these societies, again, being directly dependent on the funders uh, with all the, let's say, and they would lose uh, lots of their independence. And this is a problem which I haven't really seen a good solution for yet. I, I'm, not, I'm not excluding that there may be solutions, but in all the discussions, uh, also in particular, you know, with, with governmental officials, this is uh, not really being um, considered. And this is why I make this point. Thank you. Thank you very much for this contribution, Professor Jan. Um, I think we will have time to go back to it. Um, I would like to invite now Professor Alonso Garcia from the Consejo de Estado is, um, to, to share a bit of his uh, thoughts as well. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. Very briefly, since the discussion of the floor is probably important. I would like just simply to emphasize two or three bullet points. Uh, first of all, it is true, and not because I took it personally, it's simply true that it's infrastructures what we are talking about mostly. Uh, it is true that the open air, open science, open access, open source world has been there trying because there was a problem sort of, of, of bottleneck and which needed to be open, but the question now is that the ITC technologies, I mean, the, the communication information technologies have developed lately in the last 10 years to such an extent that the potential that they have shown us that there is there is so immense, and they're also telling them that anything, everything can be done. I mean, you could be in the middle of China and then just receive to your mobile phone exactly live the chest of a person who's having surgical operation and having the guy who's there in China. No cut here or cut there, or do this or do that, and that's perfectly feasible. They tell us that can be done, which has surprised everybody. Now, that has shifted into a different mode, which is, okay, what we need for the future is no so much any longer, even for the economy, gray infrastructures, we know the environmental impact they produce, how they move the economy, how they might simply turn resources into something that 
or leads us to stalemates. We've moved from there maybe to green infrastructure, making, try to make sure that landscapes, uh, minimum services of nature are provided, because if not, where we live is going to disappear, and it's why is that threat came with this world now? The question is, okay, for all that we need, and we can have knowledge infrastructures. Curiously enough, I think we don't need the vision. We, we simply need to revisit the past to know that the vision is already there. The first time when I was working with my colleague Americans in the National Academy of Science, what the hell is a knowledge infrastructure? How do we make them different from gray infrastructures? From green infrastructures, it's very easy. And he told me, go to 20th century Paris and to Göttingen and to see how knowledge suddenly was shared and allowed later for the scientific revolution of the 17th century for the, for the literally the growth of knowledge science which made humanity move from the Neolithic to present world. We can, of course, complain how the present world is, and there are many reasons why we should, but the, the, the potentiality of humanity really is a very, very recent thing. Now, the question is, how do we do that? And that's where the issue is. Okay, we are talking, among many things, about the opener of scientific publications, data sharing, etc. but the problem is also at the bottom. The data itself, which made possible that thinking by the scientists, what happens with them? Could other scientists benefit from that effort? Uh, that includes both the total output and the original data that there are besides the conceptualization that the creation by the scientists does. Second, it's an infrastructure. It's not a network. It should be neutral. It should be absolutely neutral, simply making sure through ITC technologies that Anything that is there can be shared by somebody who has something to incorporate that to humanity. Actually, what happens is that scientists, if they don't change to open air, are going to be simply turned over, overwhelmed by citizens themselves. That's already happening. I mean, students mm -hmm. no longer read science. They read whatever is there in Google. So the question is, OK, that's already there. How do we move from one to another? The fact that those infrastructures are probably or will be a reality 20 years from now is what makes me think that uh, it's a question of making sure that all the scientists get the knowledge. They have on their own uh, sort of a very important issue, which is okay, it's not only a question of openness, it's a question also of interoperability and that's the core of the infrastructure and the transversality, the neutrality itself of what is being built, what is important. Libraries don't have their own agenda. They simply have as agenda making possible that what they have reaches somebody else or what is there, which is not really theirs, literally reaches its content and that's why libraries were constructed. And infrastructures are somehow simply the libraries of the future, as simple as that. The final point, I've lived through that very easily. If we go back to 1992, when we first met in the commission near your office, but a little bit farther up, say, how do we know what biodiversity is there in Europe? have no clue, no idea what we had. From genomes to landscape, no idea. Now it is mapped with mini pixels directly there through ITC technologies and everybody can literally go and see exactly what is there. And that is happening worldwide in all the areas, from biomedicine to humanities to all the, all the core of, of knowledge. So the question is, okay, um, we did that only in 20 years now, the, the world that we see, the astronomers know it, but they are a very close scientific community. And, and other, it's a question perhaps, and that's my final point, of trying to do one thing, which is work with both mentalities at the same time. The reductionist mentality of the scientists, we need to open air to tackle the issue of scientific literature because that's an element of the whole component of the broader picture. But at the same time, we need to work with the sort of what we could call, you know, in the, in the box mentality rather instead of the reduction is the, the broad picture mentality of the humanities because we need principles making sure that what we set up as an infrastructure from the reductionist point of view has sense within the whole context of where we want to be of the interconnections between science and industry through march in laws which is how the americans call this embargo rules or through making sure that scientists themselves get back to society so that society can benefit from what they produce, which is what Open Air ultimately is trying to do. Scientists don't read society, and that's the reason why we have very possibly the society and the governance that we have, because there's a gap there that probably will be brought. But I think that this process is then need to continue 
from the reductionist approach, how do we make possible with all these technicalities of open air, coming up through licensing, marching laws or embargo, etc., connected with a broader vision or picture that probably is simply being aware that that exists there and being connected to processes that are happening also. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Enric. Uh, this is um, now, I think, uh, we turn to Professor uh, Ioannidis, whom you know well. Uh, Yanis, share with us your thoughts. Uh, a few uh, bullets uh, from me as well, in the interest of time. Uh, both in my presentation from yesterday, but also in others, this concept of the new way to publish, the new uh, form of publication in the current way that research is done is, is uh, central. Uh, in the past, up until, I don't know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, the main intellectual process in doing science uh, was uh, finally distilled in a piece of text that had some figures, possibly some formulas, some theorems, some other things, but that was the, the final result of the scientific process. In the past um, uh, few decades, not, not very many, uh, uh, we, are, we, are in, we have entered what some people call the fourth paradigm of doing research, which has to do with data-based research. And therefore, in, next to the publications in the traditional sense, the data that is produced uh, is a scientific result. The same way we can talk about an impactful paper, an impactful, a, a beautiful paper, a beautiful theorem, um, a, a clean conceptualization of, of some uh, area. In the same way, we can use the same uh, adjectives for data sets. And they have to be, have to be, uh, seem to be coming next to the traditional form of publications. So when it comes to open access, uh, data sets, traditional papers, and other artifacts produced uh, from um, uh, the research process should be treated in similar ways. I will not say the same because there are differences. Uh, the readability of reuse of a paper is different from the readability of reuse of a data set. Uh, uh, in, in some sense, it's very easy to get a data set and then run 10, 10 algorithms on it and produce more results. Uh, reading a paper and, and uh, extracting from it its essence is slightly different. So uh, I'm sure our good friend, the lawyers, with or without fees, will help us in figuring out what open access to data sets compared to uh, traditional publications will be. But it's it's, um, it, it's a big challenge that we have to face as, as soon as uh, possible. Um, open access is all about democratization, uh, other principles as well, uh, and this is very important. Uh, when it comes to, uh, there are always, you know, the counter arguments, oh, I did this and then the, this uh, country outside Europe that is, uh, commonly known that gets ready results and then makes products and makes money and so on uh, are, uh, are there. Still, we have to find the right ways to offer democratization, both in terms of publications and in terms of uh, data sets, and, and uh, find the right benefits and, and, and support it. Um, and, and a couple of points regarding um, Open Air. Uh, open Air has been operating, as, as we said, based on the participatory uh, philosophy. Uh, investment exists already in the trenches, in the institutions, uh, and uh, in, uh, in thematic repositories, in collecting publications. And Open Air takes all this, aggregates it, analyzes and presents it as a cohesive whole and that's the approach that, that, that we have been um, following. It's working well. The, the network of, um, of, of people in advocating at close to the researchers, close to the member states in Europe and, and possibly elsewhere, 
uh, is um, works. The same thing should happen with data. Uh, participatory infrastructure is the way to go. Uh, people develop uh, uh, infrastructures uh, for data sets. This will continue. This is something that uh, feel people have ownership of, and it should not be uh, redone and reinvented. But then getting the appropriate uh, metadata, the appropriate information about these data sets, and connecting it and linking it and analyzing it together with the corresponding uh, information about publications and other artifacts that are research results, uh, we believe is, is the right way to go. And uh, as part of this process, then trying to support the different kinds of policies that should uh, be applied, open access policies, uh, that should be applied to the various um, uh, forms of data. Thank you, Yanis. I think uh, it's now time to conclude the round table of the members of the panel with uh, Professor Losau. So Norbert, share with us a bit. Yeah, I have the interesting challenge not representing myself, but the presidential board yes. and the president, as you have heard yesterday. So <coughs> I, forgot, I forget everything I know about open access now. And I try to imagine that I'm a member of the presidential board, which I will only be on the 1st of January. Um, if I'm in this position, I would say, well, yeah, open access, I've heard about it. It's interesting. It's a library thing, so let's, mm. let's do them. And that's it. So it's rather, sh rather short, so my comment could be rather short yeah. to you. And that, but if, if, if we want to be more constructive um, in, in, in a sense, I think we, I would try with my background and now with a new position to think about how can we improve the situation for decision makers on a university level. And what we have seen in the past is that the recommendation from the Open Access Working Group of the European University Association simply have not been picked up. Definitely not in Germany. I know from many open air partners that in many other countries they don't. They don't know about the UK uh, actually, but they simply haven't been picked up. Much more successful, I think, um, have been the has been the LERU roadmap on open access. Why is this? I think you need the, the conclusion really is for university governing boards to be both informed and guided. So they need to see concrete steps, how really to implement, and they want to see the implications, what this has on the university, on the organization. And this is very often neglected because the perspective on what the implication for a university is, is mainly not clear. Now, this sounds easier than it is. Well, you go to university government board and inform them and I guide them. It's not that easy because there are many other topics on their, on their agenda. So getting the attraction, the awareness that this is a topic is already not an easy task, but can be done, and it's definitely supported by the EC recommendation communication. It's supported by organizations like DFG, which is really respected. I'm speaking now for Germany, um, at, at German universities. So from as many places accepted on a university governing board level as possible, you need to bring in uh, uh, the information. Because one thing is very clear. I mean, it's, it's nice to have um, statements and policies and everything, but as we said before and as Fred started, making the vision a reality is a problem. And the reality needs to be implemented on the local level, means at a, on a university level, on a research organization level, which are more distributed, but still. And so it's, everything needs to be done there to really get the, the buy-in and input, because otherwise we, we will never achieve the 60% uh, nor, nor the 100%. Yes, thank you, Norbert. It, I think we had really um, uh, all the points we would like to, to address, addressed by all the members of the panel in, from different angles, but this was actually the purpose. Um, and from, from the Commission side, I think we, as Carl presented, we think that basically, w for the moment, we can't do more than, than and this goes along the, the, 
what all the interventions and the, in the last one from, from Norbert, from the top-down, so to say, aspect, it's, it's more or less what can be done at this point in time because we have a formal mechanism which is a communication to the member states and to the parliament and this time was accompanied by, uh, well, we have actually two, as Daniel said, also the European Research Area, which <laughs> cross-reference the one on scientific information. Then we have a recommendation, which is, in, in our internal jargon, the, the soft uh, regulation, so to say. But it's actually an invitation for member states to take a lot of initiatives, so which actually goes al along the lines that from, from the top level, so, so to say, it's, it's really difficult to do more than that. So now came actually the invitation from Carl and all the comments goes along this. So how the stakeholders can really make this a reality? Now my only comment before opening to the, to the audience, so, because I would really like you to intervene with questions and, and also sharing your thoughts, is that I, the bottom line is that it, it, it's not a um, cost-free uh, process, the change. But uh, our commissioner was very clear when she makes public statements, uh, and Commissioner Gogan Queen as well, that it's not against anything, it's in favor of s something. Mm -hmm. and, and as in the infrastructure part, see it even more like that, because for, for us, we see uh, the open access linking data as a capacity building exercise. So as much as we see it in why are we trying in Europe to get the best high-performance computing infrastructures available to the research in general, to the research um, communities, whatever they, these are in Europe. Because we are in a competitive world and so we have to be competitive. Our director Thierry van der Peel also addressed this, that ultimately open access is not a, an objective but a means to achieve something. Mm -hmm. And Fred, Fred, uh, Frederick friend also addressed this vision of the benefits. So we focus on the benefits and we have a road to, to, to make and stakeholders will probably change some things on what they do today currently. So this is the, the call for action that comes after the top-down thing is done. Doesn't mean that we are now going to sit. We have some instruments, Horizon 2020, Daniel is working on the rules for implementation of the policies, but there are also what happens at member state level, at institutional level, which is really what will make the difference. Mm -hmm. So, with this in mind, I would like to thank the members of the panel as well, the audience, and wish you uh, a continuation of a, a very fruitful uh, discussion in, in this conference. Thank you all. <laughs>